Hi, I'm Jeremy, and today I'm going to show you a game, Android Mainframe. This is a largely abstract two-player area control game, or two to four-player area control game set in Fantasy Flight's Android Universe. I believe it's the fourth game in the series after Android, Android Netrunner, and Android Infiltration. Um, the game plays, like I said, two to four players in about 20 to 30 minutes or so. I'm going to take a minute to show you how it plays out, and then I'll come back and give you my thoughts on it. Okay, so this is what a game in progress, a three-player game in progress of Android uh, mainframe might look like. And you'll see that there is a board, which is essentially molded plastic with spaces for these um, blue pieces, which are called partitions. There's a supply of those. And then each player is going to have a set of these two-sided tokens in their color. They begin on the board face up, and if ever they're positioned so that they can be scored, you'll flip them face down. And each player will also get at random from a set of, I think, five or six cards, a set of three special power cards that they could play during the game. You, they could use each of these one time. And then also um, there's going to be a deck of cards which enable players to run these cards here, which are called programs. And a player could choose from any of those four cards to place or manipulate the board. So the way that the game is going to work is the players are going to be playing um, these various hackers who are, I guess, trying to control this uh, grid. Um, and on, at the start of the game, each player is going to be able to place one of their pieces on the board face up. This is somewhat in a game in progress. Um, and then players are going to take turns either selecting a card from here, playing a card from their hand, or discarding the top card to place another token. So let's say it was Green's turn. They might discard that card and then they would be able to place their token anywhere on the board. So maybe they would place it here. And what the goal is, is to get their pieces so that they are the only player within an enclosed area. So here, for example, Green has achieved that. They have flipped their piece over so because they're the only player present within this enclosed area of two blocks. And what that will mean is this piece will score at the end of the game. So every piece that's within an area will score points equal to the size of the area at the end of the game. So this is one, two points for green. If green had done that and, you know, had two of their pieces within the same enclosed area, both of them would score. That would be one, two, three, four points. So over the course of the game, players will be playing cards. Let's say somebody selects this card. And you could rotate these, but you can't flip them. You know, you have to do the symbols like that to place these tokens. So, for example, this player plays this, so they could go one, two, three. And then after a card is used, one will come out to replace it. So now we have a situation here, you'll note, where this is almost going to be closed off, but there are two people present. So the uh, red player might, for example, choose to play this card, which is a swap card. Sure, you can see it, which allows you to swap any two tokens that are on the board. So they could swap this token for this token. Now, if this was closed off, then that would be able to um, score just red points. You are never able to close off a section if there's no token present in it at all. And once a to section with a token, with one player's tokens, has been closed off, it can't be altered in any way. You can't build through it. You can't remove any pieces of it from it. So let's say this section was here and then you know later somebody took let's say um, this card here and placed here, here, and here. Now that would close off this section but since there are more than one player present it would not be considered a secure section, which would mean that it could not yet score. And then also, what that means is, since it is a close-off section, then you cannot remove any piece that would make it an open section. You could still build through it, you could still manipulate the tokens that are in it, but you can't you know, eradicate this border. You could, theoretically, let's say, place this tile here, which allows you to move one partition and replace it on the board. If you did that, for example, you might place this here if I was the orange player. And now all of a sudden this is two closed off sections, both complete. Because red here is by itself, out of foot. 
and orange here is by itself, so that would flip. There are some other special uh, tokens. Oh, sorry, some other special cards. There's, for example, this shift card, which allows you to move a, a face-up token to any other space. So a player could do that to move from here to here. Again, you can always take the uh, the top card without looking at it, just discard it to place a new token onto the board. And then there's one other type of card. Let me show you that. One other specific special type of card. There's this one here where you could place two partitions without having them in the same configuration. So for example, they could place here and here. They don't necessarily need to be connected to one another. Again, players will have special cards and these vary per player. Each player has different asymmetrical powers and they have various powers. I'll just show you some examples. So this power, this power for example, it says, end your turn, on your next turn, take two turns in a row. So you'll get a double turn if you sacrifice a turn. We'll say this one, discard two generic programs from the program stack, that'd be two of these cards, and add them to your hand. So again, you could basically save uh, tokens. And the various characters have various flavors. So this one, for example, remove one access point token belonging to each player, or each runner. That would be including your own. And you couldn't affect the ones that were face down, but that could, you know, really mess up people's plans. And this one, this character, for example, has swap two access point tokens, then swap two access point tokens. So that's basically a double move. And this one would let you place two access point tokens for a single move. So the game will just go like that until the end of the game, which will trigger when either this deck runs out or when all players pass in succession because they don't have a move to make. At that point, you'll score each territory. Again, each piece gets one point for each block it's within. So here, orange would have one, two, three, red would have one, and green would have two. Ideally, they would have more than one section at the end of the game, but that's the general gist of it. So that is how you'll play Android Mainframe. All right, so that is Android Mainframe. I think that this game, first of all, it has a really good production value, you know, both in the uh, cards and the card art, and then the actual board itself, which is that molded plastic, so you don't have to worry so much about knocking the board and shaking all the pieces off. Every piece has an indentation that you could place it into, which is, I think, a really good design decision. And, you know, this is a relatively light uh, 20 to 30 minute game. It actually reminds me of a similar abstract game, Onitama, which recently came out, in which players would similarly have their moves restricted by the cards. Players in that game would actually share the cards between them, and that's only two-player. But this has much the similar feel, because your moves are going to be largely dictated by the luck of the draw at any given moment. I think that that's both good and bad. It's good because um, it keeps it from being a, you know, a strictly analytical game. You know, People can't suffer from analysis paralysis when they only have a few possible choices on a turn and so that makes sure that the game only lasts you know 20 25 minutes um the downside of course is that you know sometimes you just don't have any good options on a turn especially because although you could always place a uh, token sometimes those uh, tokens you know are, they're supply limited so sometimes you might have already placed most of your tokens on the board so there's only so much that you could do um also, I've seen it, I've only played the game you know, a few times now, but I've already seen it where the cards have largely been the same because nobody wanted to do a given move at that time, especially the swap move. Um, and the game's all but locked up because of that until players you know, chose to finally take that. Especially because you cannot, a closed off zone, you can't manipulate that. You know, those lock, those uh, fetch cards are called, that allow you to move one piece anywhere on the board. Those have really limited utility if there, there's only closed sections on the board. So that's just something that I've experienced in my few games. I'm not sure how much of a pervasive problem that is. But um, that is something I've noticed. Um, also, just you know, the luck of the draw. Just Sometimes a player might have the perfect card com come out for them that enables them to do what they were you know, hedging their bets on, and there's not a lot that you could do about it. Sometimes a, a player, since you have those special power cards, you only get a few of your character's cards. Um, sometimes a player will get better cards, frankly, than another player. I'm not sure how balanced they are. all are. That card that I showed in the uh, run-through of a player being able to remove one of everybody's tokens, that seems exceptionally powerful. Um, whereas some of the other ones, you know, just give you basically a double move or allow you to shuffle cards into the deck or 
what have you, and those seem maybe less powerful or very circumstantial where those are going to be powerful. Um, so overall I would say that this is a fine light abstract game that you know generally people are going to enjoy. Um, it's not nearly as much, you know, it doesn't really, you know, people who like Android Netrunner or people who like the original Android game aren't necessarily going to like this. I wouldn't say that this is a deeply thematic game. Um, but if you like multiplayer abstract games, I think that you'd like this. This reminds me of that kids game, Dots and Crosses, that you would play um, on graph paper as a kid where you're trying to box off boxes and then you get to mark it with your space. This is pretty much that, but with a lot of chrome added onto it. And for that, I think it's fine. So those are pretty much you know my thoughts on Android Mainframe. A decent game, if not the most memorable game. So thanks for watching.